Our scripture reading today is from Micah 6, 8 and Psalm 146. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes and human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. He is the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Bruce O'Neill, and I'm one of the pastors here and have the opportunity to open the word this morning. And so, there you go. On Sunday mornings, we have been looking at this question, what does the Bible say about our work? And we said that work is anything that is not rest. In fact, we spend the majority of our days working, which is why we thought this series would be such an important one uh, to do. Last week, Pastor Michael looked at Jeremiah 29, so I recommend if you have not heard that message to listen to that message because he answered this question, what should our posture be Uh, toward the city in which we live. He said we are to build life here and we are to seek the city's shalom or peace. Today we're going to look at how to do that. We build life and we seek peace in this city when we pursue a life of justice. So this morning I want us to ask three questions of the text. And they simply are this, what is justice? What does a life of justice look like? And then third, how do we live a life of justice? So what is it? How do you live it? I mean, what what does it look like? And then how do you live the life of justice? And so in the beginning, we have to do a little defining work. But we also need to recognize there are many definitions of justice out there, all competing for one another. But many of them center around right actions, doing what is right, equity, impartiality, protection and care for the vulnerable, giving voice to the voiceless. Tim Keller in his book, Generous Justice, defines justice this way. It is giving people what they are due. The problem with the word due is we've redefined it to mean your right or what is owed you, what you have earned. That is not the biblical understanding of justice. Justice is different. In fact, the word that is often translated and is translated in uh, in this passage, it's often the word mishpat, which is M-I-S-H-P-A-T, and it appears 200 different times in the Old Testament alone, including our text here. But most often, it's simply translated justice. But sometimes it's translated as righteousness. And then other times, like in our text, the word mishpat is translated as upholding the cause. You see that in verse 7. It's upholding the cause of someone or some group, particularly those who are vulnerable, those who are victims of injustice. That's the word justice there. And the Bible presents two kinds of justice, two types of of justice. One is retributive and the other one is restorative. And retributive justice is simply uh, justice for punishing 
wrongdoing or wrongdoers for what they have done. We recognize that because our justice system often is dependent upon a retributive justice that people who do wrong are punished for the wrongdoing. So, in the Bible, Cain and Abel. Cain kills Abel, and the word justice appears there because God says your brother's blood cries out for justice from the ground. In verse 9, we see retributive justice because God says, I will frustrate. And that word frustrate literally means to make their way or their life ruins. Now, when Pastor Michael talks about his nerding out, he watches Ted Lasso. Now, why that is such a good thing, I don't know, but he loves those kinds of shows and books. I don't. When I get a chance, I nerd out on history. And so this weekend, I was nerding out on history and was trying to answer a question. Why did we stop retributive justice after World War II in 1948? Well, in 1938, uh, when um, uh, Hitler is setting up his uh, SS, which will carry out much of the genocide of World War II, he gathers them all together near Nuremberg and gives a speech on why they can do atrocity. You see, he draws attention to something that happened in 1915 through 1917, which is the Ottoman Empire's genocide of the Armenians. 1.2 million people uh, were killed in World War I simply because the Ottomans were afraid the Armenians were going to jump sides and fight against them in World War I. And so they wiped them out. There was no outcry, no trials, no one was punished for 1.2 million uh, people who perished. And so Hitler decided to use that in his speech. He says, I want you to kill men, women, and children of an inferior race. And I need you to do that without mercy because no one's going to hold you account. Because we learned that in 1917 when no one held the Ottomans account for the genocide of the Armenians. You see, this is before the invasion of Poland. This is before the concentration camps. He was telling them how to wipe out a race of people and do it with impunity because there's no retribution, no retributive justice. This particular uh, documentary went on and there's this center in Berlin that has recorded most of the atrocities that happened during World War II in Europe. There they have the names and identifications and all the evidence for over 300,000 perpetrators of the genocide. We have to date only tried 1% of the 300,000. In fact, We stopped in 1940. I know there's other trials, but we stopped as the Allies in 1948. Cold War, lots of reasons. But here's the point. If there's no punishment for wrongdoing, if there's no retributive justice, injustice will continue. But there's also restorative justice, and that's very different. Restorative justice is the protection of and the care for the vulnerable, the oppressed, those who are experiencing injustice. That's verse 7. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry, and the Lord sets the prisoner free. So, who does our passage in in, uh, Psalm 146 identify as those who need restoration, restorative justice? He lists them, verse 7, the oppressed, the hungry, those in prison, those that are in prison unjustly and without compassion. Verse 8, the physical and emotionally broken. Verse 9, immigrants, orphans, widows, and poor. Nicholas uh, Waterstorff uh, calls that last group the quartet of the vulnerable because they appear over and over again in the Old Testament and in fact are repeated in the New Testament. 
as a group of people that are particularly vulnerable. These people are vulnerable not simply because they are human beings, but simply because of their plight in this world. It makes them targets of injustice, and too often no one hears their cries for justice uh, because they simply don't have a voice in the system. They're also vulnerable because these systems that operate don't take into account their particular plight, their particular struggle. And so there is no voice. I remember uh, over early part of the 2000s, I used to be a teacher, and so I kind of follow this. Uh, they began to notice that standardized touching, testing in America uh, has, a, has a racial bias to it or at least an ethnic and cultural bias, if not a racial bias to it. And, and they began to question, is it good for a particular dominant culture to write tests to measure aptitude of those of different ethnic and cultural backgrounds? Also, besides that, uh, another restorative justice, when I was in one Alabama town as a pastor, uh, the town was trying to expand, and so they were annexing parts of the county for tax purposes. That is, if you tax the right places, you can get more money for the system. And we had a particularly great resort on the outskirts of town, but it's a place called Point Clear, and they wanted just the hotel and the golf course, not the people who lived in Point Clear, which were very poor. Typically, they were the homes of those who were previously sharecroppers or former slaves and didn't have necessarily deeds to their home and therefore paid no taxes. See the injustice. Nobody uh, stood up and said, this is wrong. But injustice is not merely withholding uh, from someone what they're due. It is also we participate and perpetuate injustice when we ignore injustice. When we ignore the vulnerable and those, ignore the systems that take advantage of those who are most vulnerable. Edmund Burke is credited with this statement. We have no idea whether he really said it or not. It's just good. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. When I grew up in Alabama in my hometown, I grew up in the 60s and 70s. I can still remember the signs. Uh, color water fountains, pools that were not open to people of color. There were neighborhoods where African Americans could not live, stores where African Americans could not go in, and schools that were separate. In 1963, Martin Luther King went to jail in Birmingham protesting those signs and what they represented to African Americans in Alabama in particular. The white clergy in Alabama, particularly of Birmingham, wrote an editorial in the Birmingham News. It's called A Call to Unity. And the white clergy said, this is not the time for protest. This is the time for peace. That is, in the, in the editorial, they said, we see all these injustices that you do, He's speaking to the black clergy that were protesting. But this isn't the time. And so Martin Luther King Jr. wrote an article himself, a letter from the Birmingham jail in which he said this. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. If you think that not doing something prevents injustice it actually exasperates the injustice because nobody stands up and nobody stands up with the victims of injustice. In fact, because they failed to stand up with the African-American clergy in 1963, it's another 20 years before those signs are taken down, before those doors opened up before the swimming pools became integrated in the schools. Which brings us to the second question. If that's what justice is, what does a life of justice look like? And your answer to that question is determined by how much brokenness you can see. 
The answer to the question of how to live a life of justice is based on your ability to see brokenness wherever it is. If I can only see brokenness in terms of individual experience, mine or theirs, then I will be blind to the broken systems that may be oppressing and hurting people in our society. Because I can only see it in individual terms. And if that's true, then I will only focus on evangelism, ethics, and personal morality to address the brokenness that I can see. Because that's all the brokenness I see. And if I can see broken systems and that's all I can see in society, I will miss seeing the person in front of me and their personal brokenness. And so I will work, if I only see it this way, for social justice. For the victims of injustice and the vulnerable but feel no responsibility for spiritual brokenness of my neighbor. You see, the psalm is incredibly balanced. In Psalm 146, it, it starts out by talking about the brokenness of my own heart. Verse 3, do not put your trust in princes, in human beings who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground, and on that day, their plans come to nothing. You see, when you meet people on the street, their spiritual condition, their spiritual brokenness matters. Blessed are those who help in God of ja- who, who help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. And then down in verse 7, the other half. If that's one half, to see the individual plight, to see the individual need, there's also a systemic. In verse 7, it is God who upholds the cause where justice of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoner free. The Lord gives sight to the blind and the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner and sustains the fatherless and the widow and frustrates the ways of the wicked. Incredible both hands. That's the whole reason God gave us two hands. We can hold on to two realities, two truths, two broken systems at one time. We can see the individual in one sense, in their spiritual need, and we can see the brokenness of a system all at the same time. We don't have to be social warriors at the expense of someone's soul, and we don't have to at the expense of reaching the lost to give up what is broken in our society by the fall. We don't have to do that. We can do both. And to the degree that we see both, we will fully enter in. It's only if I can see the broken systems in our society. Well, I miss seeing the person in front of me. It's only when we see both individual and corporate brokenness can we fully enter the brokenness of our world and work to repair it, restoring people, places, and things. Only when we are not blind to all the brokenness can we fully engage in with the gospel and all of its implications as stewards. Only when we can say with Abraham Kuyper when he looked at and said every square inch of this creation belongs to God. And only then can we participate in God's restoring work of broken places. This is the life of justice. Well, how can we live that life? If that's what it means to live a life of justice, what hope is there for us? Where do we find the motivation to enter in, to see? Let me give you the principle and then apply the principle. First, the principle is this. The deeper your relationship is with a person, the more you will be changed by that relationship. The deeper your relationship is with a person, the deeper the change you will undergo as the result of that relationship. You know that's true on on a marriage level. You know that's true on a best friend level. You know that's true experientially. But let me show that to you. Do you see this principle at work? This psalm begins with, praise the Lord, praise the Lord my soul. But then the next question is, praise him for what? You're worshiping him, 
To what end? What end is this relationship? And he begins to say who God is and what God does. He goes right at the identity of God himself. And we see that in verse 6 when he says, He is the maker of heaven and earth. The sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever. So the very first thing is to know your God as your creator. Not only your creator, the creator of all things. Everything comes from God. But also in verse 7, in we begin to see him not only as the creator, but the repairer. Because the creation didn't stay the way he created it to be. It began to be broken by human sin. And because of that, he has to repair what has been broken. Do you see him as the creator and the repairer? Micah 6, 8 says, you want to know what I require of you as a follower of mine? This verse has been quoted so often because it starts out with, what do I require of you? And it's been said many different ways. Let me try a different translation on you than than the one that's right here. If you want to do what God requires with all your heart, then you need to walk humbly with your God. How? By doing justice and loving mercy. But let me just say up front, commanding us to do justice won't work. Not long term. Even if God is the commander commanding us to do justice, at some point we will revert back to our default heart setting of doing that which is good for us rather than what is good for our neighbor. We will measure things by what is good, what works for us. So we need a motive that is greater than a simple command. And what is that motive? We need a motive that doesn't just address our behavior, but also changes our heart. Whenever and whatever captures your heart, motivates you. You know that's true because when you listen to a piece of music or, or you read a book or you watch a movie or you go to a restaurant or you have a best friend, all of those things motivate you. And they are far lasting motivations than knowing simply what is right and what is wrong. You need to know those things. But they won't motivate you. It will take an intimate relationship to motivate us to do justice. And that is an intimate relationship with God who will change our hearts to love and do justice. He moves us to do justice because justice is at the heart of God. As we get closer in our relationship to the heart of God, we will see that his heart is for justice. The closer our relationship is with God, we are moved by what moves him. Let me, if you'll just give me a minute, show you that. Luke 4 describes Jesus' first sermon. We have it recorded for us. It's even told this the first time that he teaches. He's in a synagogue. And someone brings him a scroll, whether he asked for the scroll or they just gave him the scroll. All the Old Testament were on, sit, on uh, stacks of scrolls, and he rolls out and he reads Isaiah 61, but not the whole chapter, just a part of it. And then he says, today, this has been fill, fulfilled in your presence. What do you think God's sent his son into the world, why he's here. He's going to give his first message. He's now going to be identified. Today, this has been fulfilled. Which passage do you think he would pick to identify with from the get-go of his ministry? He's 30 years old. And he says this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to recovery of the sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. That's what he decides to do is is to quote that part of Isaiah 61. But if you know Isaiah 61 and you look at this passage, 
he leaves a phrase out. So I want to make two points. Because he stops in mid-sentence when he says, and this has been fulfilled in your presence. First, all things he could have said, all parts of the Bible he could have read from of the Old Testament, he reads from this one. And so he's saying, I'm going to show you where my heart is from the beginning of my ministry. I'm going to show you what's the closest to the closest part of my heart. It's about injustice. It's about brokenness. It's about broken people, places, and things. The vulnerable. And I promise I have come to restore them. Those who are experiencing injustice, those who are suffering unjust systems, Jesus says, I was sent to bring you good news. I hear you. I see you. And I will repair you. My second point is this. What is missing is deafening from this passage. As I said, Jesus didn't quote the whole verse. He stops. But the part that's missing is this. And the day of vengeance. Why? Why would he miss that important part of that? Not only am I here to restore all things, I'm not here just to do uh, restorative judgment. I'm also here to do retributive judgment. Why do you think he left that out? I think it's because Jesus doesn't tell us that he is going to repair broken people, places, and things only. The way in which he is going to repair the broken is to be broken himself. The reason he doesn't talk about the day of vengeance is because he takes on vengeance for us. The way that he has decided to make in unjust things just, the way he uh, begins to deal with broken people, places, and things and says, in order to bring you heal, I have to first be broken. For you. And if you believe that, if you begin to take that into your heart, then you are free to enter broken people, places, and things. One of the reasons we don't enter is because we think our time and our money and our talents are scarce. And we're afraid if we give them away, then there won't be enough for us. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that that's the reason we don't enter broken people, places, and things? Because we're afraid. Most common command in Scripture is do not be afraid. He's recognizing that when we begin to think of how big this is, That we withdraw because we're afraid. And he says, don't be afraid. I have already entered where I'm asking you to go. In fact, I'm already there. All I'm doing is inviting you to join me there. See, we tend to think of it, you come here to worship, and then we send you out into the broken places by yourself we come here to worship him and then he goes with us there isn't that the way the great commission goes all authority has been given unto me go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptize them in the name of the father and of the son and the holy spirit and teaching them all that i have commanded you here it is for lo the word means to behold i am with you also even to the end of the age. We can go to the broken people, places, and things, not only because he's already there, but because he goes with us there. Doing justice begins with an intimate relationship with God, who is the God of justice. We can begin to do 
justice. We can join him on this journey of justice by pursuing a deep and abiding relationship with him who has already entered and just beckons us to come. And we can join him in God's restoration business. You know that whole sign when dad owns a business and says, father and sons. The restoration business, he already says, God and sons and daughters. Come, enter in. This is what you were built for. Let's pray. Father, thank you that this is true. I pray as we are afraid, afraid of scarcity, afraid that what we have, that we have accumulated, will be gone if we give it away. Whether it's our time, or our talent, or our treasures. The truth is, this is what we were built for. A father who sent his son into the world to be broken, that we might enter in to the broken places into the lives of broken people where things have been broken by sin and to seek the repair, seek the restoration wherever we can, what little we can do, what we can do bound together in community and what we can do with you for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen.